the introduction and uh, glad everybody can join us for a little while today. I hope everyone's having a good day. Uh, again, my name is Phil and uh, I'm going to be talking about a platform uh, that I've put together and uh, a little bit about the background here called Soft Elk and uh, based on some of the people I see in the uh, attendee list so far. I know a couple of you are familiar with it, but even if you are, we've got a bunch of new stuff that, uh, that I wanted to kind of talk through and, and kind of give you an idea of the roadmap of what we're looking at. First of all, uh, let me give you a little bit of background about where I come into the mix. Um, my name, again, is Phil, uh, and I've been doing information security for a long time from a lot of different perspectives. Um, I've worked on all sides of the color spectrum, uh, you know, red, blue, purple, whatever you want to try and think of uh, in those capacities, and uh, done that in a variety of different environments, both uh, native government as well as government contracting uh, on the intel, law enforcement, and DOD sides of the house. Also had a chance to uh, support a, a large number of really big um, law enforcement operations uh, that resulted in um, a variety of indictments and some convictions and such. But really the, the common thread to a lot of that has been that our amount of data that we're dealing with is not getting smaller. And I'm sure a lot of you are very, very familiar with that as well. So we wanted to try and uh, set up a lot of what we put together and what I've built into Soft Elk in that kind of capacity, uh, just a lot of different use cases. These days, I split my time between two primary functions. Um, my day job is with Red Canary, where we created a large uh, managed threat detection and response platform, and uh, something that uh, really primarily focuses on um, endpoint data at this point, but we're dealing with massive, massive scales of data. Um, you know, we're well, well into the triple digit terabytes per day worth of data that we're dealing with. And it's pretty fascinating to, uh, to see how large scale platforms have been uh, built to handle that on the enterprise side. And on the soft elk side, I kind of wanted to build something that works a little bit more uh, well suited to the uh, analysis world. The other thing that I do is uh, a lot of SANS work. I've been with SANS since about 2010, and I'm a senior instructor and the course lead for Forensics 572, which is our network forensics course, which covers a variety of different ways of doing network-based investigations and uh, the types of evidence that we deal with there. And just to give you an idea of scalability, um, in our latest version of Forensics 572, uh, we are giving all of our students for the capstone challenge uh, lab that they do for a full day of lab work uh, over 100 gigabytes worth of data. And although only about four or so gigabytes of that uh, compressed are log data, it's still vast, vast amounts of information ranging into uh, almost a half a billion log entries. So having a, a platform that can start to address that even in a small capacity is really, really important. Aside from the work stuff, uh, I live in Southern Delaware, where I am right now. It's actually a beautiful day outside, kind of sunny and, uh, and a little bit crisp for a change. And uh, I'm also just a big fan of, uh, of craft beer, which I know a number of you probably realize, but that has nothing to do with soft elk. It just kind of gives you a little bit of an idea of uh, why when you see me around to the events, sometimes I'm, uh, I'm running because I want to burn those calories so I can enjoy some of the good stuff from, uh, from locally. Let me start with a background on the platform in the first place. Um, I'm sure that by now, almost all of you have heard of the Elastic Stack. So I'm not going to get in really, really deep on all the guts of what it is. Instead, I just want to give you the, the elevator pitch, if you will. Um, Elastic, uh, formerly widely known as the Elk Stack, is a very large scale data storage, indexing, and searching platform. Um, think of this as kind of like a document centric database, if you will. And I'll show you a little bit about what that means in uh, some screenshots coming up. But it was originally called the Elk Stack, and uh, that was based on the three primary components. And they moved in part to the word terminology for elastic because of uh, the addition of a separate component. But uh, the E in Elk uh, stood for the elastic search component. That's going to be actually the large cluster capable storage engine, um, massively, massively scalable. Uh, and I know of some installations where they're holding uh, well over 100 billion with a B uh, records in their elastic stack. And uh, that's a pretty massive accomplishment, no matter how you want to look at that. The L portion stood for Logstash. Uh, that was going to be your ingest engine where you're reading in and adding on to and manipulating the data that you're parsing. The K was the place that we're going to be focusing on a little bit today, which is the Kibana interaction, uh, which is a web-based means of visualizing the data, interacting with the data and such. 
And then they added on a number of log shippers called beats. These are really tiny, lightweight pieces of code that are designed to ship one specific kind of data. So you've got a file beat that's going to ship log, just file contents. You've got a packet beat, which is going to ship network data, and so on and so forth. There's quite a number of these. There's a lot of other components as well, and I'm not going to beleaguer the point with uh, all of those various uh, bits and pieces. But uh, some of those are paid, some of those are free, but majority of these are going to be open source and free, and it's a very well uh, constructed engine that uh, um, that you can use with the right amount of time investment to get up to those large scales of data processing. If you are interested in learning a lot more about all of the background information on all of the technical guts of what the Elastic Stack brings to the table, take a look at this URL down at the bottom. Um, this is a fantastic primer that uh, my friend and another SANS instructor, John Hubbard, put together. And I actually just listened to it on a layover last week. And this really, really is the best primer that I've seen so far. So definitely take a quick look at that URL and, um, and grab that because that's worth your time. It's about an hour and 10 minute talk. And if you really wanna know a lot about how it's doing data management and such, um, that is really gonna be your best starting point. But that's just going to be the elastic stack. Let's talk about why Soft Elk exists in the first place. Um, first of all, by terminology, uh, stands for the Security Operations and Forensics Elks uh, installation. So we kind of came up with the acronym that way. And it was designed to overcome some of the learning curves that are associated with a lot of those very big, very technical deep dive platforms in the elastic stack. So it is a full, fully functioning, uh, pre-configured, ready to go elastic stack appliance. It's got all of the plumbing and system administration and system engineering components taken care of. And my goal in creating this was, I want you just to be able to download this virtual machine, uh, boot it up and start feeding it some of the most common forms of log data. And then it's gonna be able to, to handle those as well as visualize them right out of the box. So it was really designed to be a friction-free way for you to get some means of searching, visualization, uh, indexing capability against, you know, let's say your, your most important 10 to 20 log sources that you might encounter. And we're supporting a lot more than that, which I'll get into a little bit later. But uh, it's really, really been awesome to hear feedback from students in class as well as people in the community in general about how they've been able to put this into play. Uh, you know, they've been able to deploy this in a variety of locations around the world, in law enforcement, government, uh, commercial capacities. Um, I had one student a few weeks ago who actually uh, was able to put this into Amazon EC2. I'm still hoping to get some more details on that, but there's a lot of flexible ways that people have been able to take this appliance and put it into play, which uh, really, really, uh, you know, is, it makes it all worth it for me. I'd really love to hear from people and how they're using it. The URLs that you've got up here um, are gonna help you get access to that. Uh, the first one's just gonna take you to a readme, and uh, the second one will take you to our GitHub repository. And that's another important component, is that this at Soft Elk code base and all the configurations are fully, completely open source, and they are in my GitHub repository. So you can feel free to check out all of our parsers, our visualizations, dashboards, as well as some of the helper scripts that I've created. And all of that is um, commercial-free, uh, commercial capable to be used, uh, however you might want to, uh, to put that into, uh, into play. Um, in terms of what we created this for, uh, this is going to be uh, primarily, originally I should say, designed for Forensics 572. Uh, so I had a need to handle a couple million records uh, at the time and needed a platform to do it. So we decided to use the Elastic Stack and that kind of morphed into what became the Soft Elk Virtual Machine. Since then though, it has been brought into a couple of other SANS courses, not just in the, um, uh, not just in the forensics world, but Security 555, uh, which is about tactical SIM, and uh, that's uh, written by Justin Henderson, fantastic course, and they use a number of different SIM and SIM-like platforms, including Soft Elk. And then we most recently added on Security 501, which is our Enterprise Defender course, and uh, they're using uh, uh, that. Dave Shackelford has uh, created a lab around Soft Elk functionality as well. So a lot of good stuff, and I also have to stress that it is not specifically a SANS appliance or anything like that. It is not locked to the class. I want to reiterate that it is a free community resource, and anybody out there can go ahead and download this. It's a, a real 
a convenient way for you to get your hands on, uh, um, you know, get your hands on a, what I consider to be a pretty powerful platform without having to know a whole lot about Linux system administration and, and a whole bunch of other stuff. So that's what we wanted to build. And, and I'm happy to say right now, as of uh, yesterday when I checked, I think we're still looking at somewhere around 16,000, 17,000 downloads since the project was started, which is pretty awesome. Plus, there's been a lot of other GitHub activity as well. Um, a couple of questions that had come up here, um, and I wanted to use this as an opportunity to uh, uh, to talk about the questions as well. Um, URL for uh, John's uh, for John's uh, talk. Uh, let me get that back for you real quick. Let me just uh, go back right here, just right there at the bottom. You can go ahead and take a look at that one, um, and then. Um, we saw there was another question that came in. How does it compare with Security Onion? Um, Security Onion is a network-based um, IDS slash network security monitoring platform. Um, it does work in similar fashion with some data types, specifically some of our Zeek logs, which I'll get into momentarily. But um, it is going to be, Security Onion is primarily designed for the security operations function. We're adding on a, a forensic capacity as well, and we are not reading live network data. So we are reading information um, from log sources, which I'll, uh, I'll get into a little bit later. Um, let's see, so uh, let me get back into here. Let's talk about our core data sources. What can we feed this? I mentioned this a second ago. Uh, log data, uh, there is a lot of different log data out there that I'm sure you're encountering. Some people I know of are encountering hundreds of different log formats out there. So although our goal is of course to accommodate as many of those as possible, I don't think we're gonna be able to accommodate every single one. That's a, that's a large number to type, aim for. So we started out with the, the easy stuff, not necessarily easy, but the common stuff. So syslog was the first thing that we handled. And it's not just the syslog format, which is a semi-standardized log format. It's writing parsers to handle a couple dozen different SSH log types, to, um, to handle NTP logs, to handle DHCP, DNS, and a variety of other log types. We also handle um, web server logs uh, in a number of different formats, uh, whether it be coming directly off your web server or maybe a proxy server, so we handle those as well. Um, and we've recently added in some functionality for Zeek, uh, formerly known as Bro, but the Zeek Network Security Monitoring Platform is a great security operations and forensics tool that we can ingest a number of those log types. And although right now we're not universally supporting all of them, not to the extent that something like Security Onion is, uh, we are focusing on those log formats that are gonna help us out most commonly in the typical type of a forensic analysis workflow. Being that it was originally developed for a uh, network forensics class, uh, I also incorporate NetFlow into our visibility. And if you're not familiar with NetFlow, definitely something to Google. Uh, it is a statistical summary of network traffic. So it is a content-free um, uh, a summary of network traffic that can be really helpful because of its speed. So the fact that we can uh, search through millions upon millions of records of network summaries in a matter of seconds brings a tremendous amount of power as well. We handle that through a couple of different uh, avenues. We do handle native NetFlow version 5, and I've got a couple of tests underway getting NetFlow version 9 to work. Then we also handle Zeek's connection logs and Amazon's VPC flow. Got some other testing involved right now with some other cloud-based flow solutions like Azure and a couple of others. And those will be released as we are able. And um, I'll talk a little bit about the upgradability of the platform as well. For all of those major uh, log formats, we always aim to support ingesting that log data in two different fashions. First of all, live. That's gonna be that security operations uh, use case. And live data comes in the form of syslog transactions, file beat or, or just elastic beat transactions, um, the reliable event logging protocol or RELP. And there's a variety of other remote log capabilities that we have, so it becomes your log aggregator at that point. It also supports the forensic use case. This is something that's really important for me because if I can't throw in, you know, a couple, you know, 100 gigabytes worth of data and have a, a system, you know, be able to consume that after those logs are created, it's not really useful to me from a forensic point of view. Um, it would mean that I need to have a live aggregator operational during the period of interest or during the compromise or, or anything like that. And that's not always going to be feasible. Otherwise, we wouldn't have post-incident forensics, of course. 
So those are all things that, uh, that are kind of the core tenants, tenants that I have um, for the platform as well. Um, let's see, so a uh, question came in on Windows EVTX. Uh, that's something we had been testing. However, right now our primary use case for Windows logs is gonna be from uh, forwarding those through to a syslog pipeline using something like Snare. Uh, that's one of our primary functions that we have right now. We are looking to try and incorporate EVTX at rest, but that comes with a couple of complexities that we're not quite ready to handle. And that may be something that we end up dealing with in a, uh, a Beats uh, perspective. But that's something on the horizon, just not something that I've got uh, immediately in front of me right now. Another question, um, NetFlow 9, yep, we are working toward that. Uh, changes a lot of things when you go from five to nine, and uh, I had to wait until IPv6 was natively supported. So yes, we are working toward that. Um, and uh, we, uh, we will be continuing to support the live data version. So uh, the question came in on that. So it'll always be a live plus at rest because I really think those are, are pretty critical for both use cases. And I also like to show how a single workflow can support both the live and the post-incident analysis kind of capacities. So how do we load this thing? Um, I'm primarily gonna be focusing on the forensic use case here. Obviously coming out of the DFIR curriculum at SANS, uh, that's pri my primary use case, it's primarily where I work uh, in, in a daily grind as well. So there's a couple of different log types. And if we're talking about regular old logs, it's pretty easy. Just take the uncompressed files and drop them in the location where I, uh, I point you to. There are a number of different locations depending on the type of data that you're feeding in. But if you're talking about uh, web server logs or syslog, here's a couple of examples of commands. Anything in that slash log stash directory um, that you see there in both of the parents of the destination directories here is going to be uh, one of the ingest locations. So that's going to be based on the source type. All you do is drop the files in there and you are golden because we've got um, some file beat prospectors that are going to be full time, always looking in those locations trying to uh, pick up any new logs that are, uh, show up. So that's gonna be the, the first place that we have for, uh, for that log data. Now, on the other hand, if we're looking at NetFlow, well, we gotta do a couple of post-processing steps. Um, unfortunately, your NetFlow coming in a post-incident format requires parsing. And uh, right now we're supporting two of what I'd consider to be the foremost um, uh, NetFlow log storage formats that our users and, and our uh, students have encountered. That's going to be in a uh, format from a tool called NFCAPD, as well as in Amazon's VPC flow. And uh, if you take a look here, uh, you've got these two helper scripts. Um, first command is NF dump to soft elk. That's going to take that NFCAPD data. It's going to basically read through all this packed binary source information and write that out into the text file that's listed on the command line, also in that log stash directory. And it's going to put that into a format that soft elk can understand that I've written the parsers for. So that's gonna be the, uh, the primary use case for, uh, for most of what we do in our class, as well as a lot of what we're doing in tactical incident response environments. Same kind of thing for VPC flow though, uh, where you're basically just gonna rip through that uh, directory full of JSON that you pull out of your Amazon console, your, uh, your EC3, EC2 console, and then it's gonna write that out in a format that we understand as well. Uh, I mentioned that we do handle Zeek's connection logs. Those are handled the same way, but those are pretty easy. Just drop your con logs into the log stash Zeek directory, and we're gonna pick those up and go ahead and parse everything out pretty, uh, um, pretty straightforward. We also will deal with the, um, uh, all of these different types of NetFlow, for example, and normalize them into the same data structures. And that means that you can query all of these different types of flow in the same dashboard with the same queries, et cetera. So a lot of different, um, a lot of different stuff that, uh, that you can do there. Take a look at a couple of questions. Um, integration available to existing SIM platform? No, that's not really on our horizon. Uh, there's too many of them and they uh, all have a different integration requirements. Plus this is really not designed to replace a SIM. It's designed to be more for that kind of tactical functionality. Um, and uh, let's see, one other question. Uh, so uh, current version of Elastic has native NetFlow ingestion. Um, so, uh, that's going to take, still going to take some, uh, uh, some handling. We do handle NetFlow 
live uh, version five right now and nine on the way. Those do use Elastic, not Elastics, but Logstash is native ingest. And we are not ingesting directly to Elasticsearch. We are ingesting everything through Logstash, which allows us to do field normalization and enrichment, which I'll talk about in a little bit. And a uh, question on the URL, I'll get to that at the end. So let's see what else we got here. Um, I mentioned the normalization. I mentioned the, in, the enrichment. A lot of your data is in very different formats. Uh, you know, you've got to come up with some way of querying all of that as, uh, as quickly and, and as consistently, more importantly, as possible. And for example, we have standardized on a naming scheme across all of our different log sources. And they will all include, if they've got a source IP address, we're going to use the word source underscore IP, for example. Uh, not SRC IP or SRC underscore IP. And the fact that you can now query against all your data sources with that same field and that same structure means that it's a, a nice, easy learning curve and it's a very consistent use case. We've got a lot of different, uh, um, different steps where we are doing that normalization, but the big, big benefit that Logstash provides and the configurations that we provide are enrichment. Um, I can take all of the data that I parse out of every single log entry and add to it, and I do. Uh, so for every IP address, um, I have it add on both GeoIP data as well as ASN, uh, which is autonomous system numbers or network owners. And uh, it adds those on from uh, local databases. So we're not doing any off system lookups for those lookups in particular. Those are all being handled locally. I also do some dynamic field creation. Um, so a lot of our record types, for example, will be able to explicitly parse out both source and destination bytes as separate fields. And I will be able to then mathematically put those together into something I call total bytes instead of source and destination bytes. And it's a way that we can uh, kind of give you some extra, extra value in terms of being able to query in a slightly different way. And a lot of those enrichments are done at runtime and query time, which means that they don't take up extra space in the databases. There's a whole bunch of other stuff in here um, that, that we are doing. Uh, what I did want to uh, try to identify as well is uh, our document tagging. Um, so each record in the Elasticsearch database is called a document. And each document can receive tags of any number. It's just an array full of tags. And these tags are some, some of them I create my, myself in the parsers. Others you can certainly add on later on if you would like to do that as well. But these are helpful because they kind of tell you how that record was parsed. Um, it basically traces its way through the parsing pipeline. And for example, in your web server logs, um, I add a tag if it is a resource that is not a, like a normal just web page, like if it's a JPEG or if it's a JavaScript or CSS or something. And um, that's going to be uh, something that, that you can then use to query as well. I'll kind of show you where that comes in. So a lot of things are added on. And I would probably say that this is an area of particular interest for a lot of our users because it's uh, something that, that they can use to, uh, to, to kind of build their own queries against and, and figure out the best way to find the information they're looking for. Uh, let me take a real quick look. There are a lot of questions in here I want to try and get to. Um, Let's see, uh, uh, loading PCAP, that is not loaded. Uh, we don't handle PCAP. You would need to pro process that with something like Zeek. Um, let's see, uh, Moloch integration, uh, that's gonna be where you're gonna go for full packet capture and storage. So that's something that is kind of a parallel. We also use Moloch in Forensics 572 as well. Um, Ah, that's a good question. Um, Derek asked about using the common schema from Elastic. Currently, no, we are not. And uh, that's something I'm going to be moving toward. But the field upgradability that we've, we've put into practice uh, in the VM is going to help with that. So I'm glad you asked. And it is something that actually came out long after we had originally come up with our own naming scheme. So it's just going to be a migration that we're going to have to handle. So. Um, Let's see, uh, yeah, all right. Uh, there's a couple of other questions, but I think those will be pretty clear um, from, uh, from a little bit uh, later on in the material. So let me go ahead and move forward because this is the good part. This is the part that I spent the most time on creating for you. Um, dashboards and visualizations. Um, that's gonna be really where you kind of really interact with your data. So 
So let's take a look at the, the first one. Um, first of all, this is just a summary dashboard. Uh, this is one that basically gives you a little bit of orientation about the environment. And uh, it's basically gonna tell you how many records are covered per time period that you have uh, a search for. So if you look way up in the upper right-hand corner, you'll see that I've got the last 15 years currently listed. And uh, I just did that to maximize the, uh, uh, the look at everything. But if I was only looking at the last year, you know, I might only have a, a billion or so logs or something like that. But it just gives you an idea of what's present. Um, this is gonna be a, a summary. And then the real work is going to be where you jump into the various log specific dashboards. This is gonna be the syslog dashboard. And if this looks kind of familiar, it's probably because it is, and it, this is going to be a, uh, a pretty familiar interface for any of you that have used a SIM or a log aggregator in the past. So across the top here, we've got a, a graph that shows the number of events per time unit, and this is dynamic. So right now we've zoomed into a pretty tight little window worth of time, uh, basically looking at about a month and a couple of days worth of data. So our individual time slices are gonna be 12 hours each. Um, that's gonna be uh, across the top. And one of the things you can do here is you can actually you know, select windows of interest. So I'd actually be able to select just one uh, little, little bump right in here, zoom in on that and see what's left. Down below in the second row here, these two pie graphs that we've got, uh, because I am parsing syslog data, I know what those fields are gonna be and what uh, they're gonna contain. So I'm parsing out both the source host name, because I aggregate logs together from sometimes lots and lots of different servers, as well as the program. And those are gonna be identified based on what the syslog log event is. Any of you have seen the syslog message, you certainly know what I'm talking about. For those of you who aren't familiar with it, it's just two fields that are, are fairly common and standardized in the syslog interface. A little bit uh, down below though is really where things start to get interesting. Um, down below is going to be a uh, list of all of the records that are currently in scope, that are currently being displayed based on time unit and searching and filtering, which I'm gonna show you next. And this is just a summary. Uh, think of this as kind of like a very, very brief screenshot uh, or a spreadsheet, excuse me. Um, so it's a spreadsheet basically of what's currently being viewed. And I've broken out some of these fields like the host name, which I had to redact, but which would be present there. And then the syslog program name as well. Same values that feed into those graphs from up above. Now the message is where things get a little bit difficult because this is really gonna be fairly free form information depending on who created that message. So for example, we've got uh, SSH and HTTP log events shown. Those are gonna be by whatever application or whatever utility generated those messages, which means you and I as the analysts in the equation here, we need to actually get a little bit deeper in here. I totally get that you're not gonna be able to read this. I'm gonna zoom up in a second, give me a moment. But what you're seeing here is a list of all of the fields that are present for that one log entry. So let me back up one. If you look over to the left-hand side of each of these rows, you get the little triangle. Uh, anybody who's used Wireshark is familiar with this. You click on that and I kind of think of it as unrolling the entire document. And the document just consists of these key value pairs. And as I zoom up on a little of them, some of these are gonna be pretty important, pretty useful. So for example, I've got a, a severity, I've got a facility. Those are gonna be syslog artifacts that are uh, included from the, uh, the load event. The message itself is gonna be, um, you know, is gonna be the one that's displayed previously, but we've actually broken that down into, you know, the source IP address. There's actually this unable to negotiate field, which gets broken out into a field, which means you can now parse on that. You can now search through that. It's not just looking through raw text, which really would make this nothing more than a big graphical glorified version of GREP. In this case, we're able to query across all those different data types based on source, destination port, based on the autonomous system numbers that I mentioned before. So uh, the source IP address in this particular log entry came from you know, whatever this data center is in Bulgaria um, or this, uh, um, this ISP in Bulgaria. And this is a great way for you to really explore that data. And a lot of these different um, components here are also going to allow you to interact and become more dynamically queryable as well. So I'm gonna look uh, at a couple of the questions really quick while we're here. Um, 
So uh, I had a question asked about any kind of sample data. I do include a little bit of that in the public distribution. Um, you can read the documentation that I will get you the link back to, to uh, at the end of the presentation here to help you to uh, understand a little bit more about what is uh, present, that sample data that's there and how to load it. Um, and another really good question, Sean asked about um, how much data can be loaded. It kind of depends on your infrastructure. Um, the VM that you download uh, is probably good with its specifications as configured to about 10 million records. That's not a hard limit. I've gone much higher than that. It just depends on your system itself. But I've also taken that exact same virtual machine and put it on some heavy iron and uh, booted it in another virtualization infrastructure with about 64 gigs of RAM, gave it a couple terabytes of drive space, about a, I think I gave it about 24 cores of a CPU, and I had that up to about a half a billion records, and, uh, and, and then I got bored and wanted to blow it away and start it over again. So in terms of scalability, um, it's really gonna be dependent on your infrastructure. And I do know of some students, I won't mention one who put this into EC2, also mentioned, um, noted, uh, wanted to note another student who had built a cluster of Elasticsearch and basically put this as a part of that cluster, and um, and they were able to get some pretty big numbers, which I don't remember off the top of my head, but it is a very uh, capable to scale that up. Um, let's see, uh, adding dynamic columns. Um, Let's see, there is not, let's see, that's a good question. Um, I'm gonna try to come back to that one if we have time, that's a little bit more detailed as well. Um, but uh, but that is a good one I wanna try to think of. And uh, can you convert the VM and export it to vSphere? Uh, that is something I know has been done uh, because it is in VMware format. So I know it's possible, um, I just uh, am, it's not something I can test and emulate in my own lab, so it's not something that I've documented out, but if you have a means of documenting that, I'm sure that that would be appreciated, and pull requests are always, always appreciated as well. Um, let's see. Uh, to, uh, oh, we got somebody using it in a production environment. That's good, excellent to see. Um, and let's see. All right, yeah, let me go ahead and move on to the next dashboard right here. Um, there are, as I said, means of interacting with your data. So it's not just read only. And if we go all a little bit back up toward the top and go over those pie graphs, as you hover your mouse over any of those slices, um, it will actually give you immediate feedback on what the uh, content is and how much of it there is. So you can see in this data set that I had loaded for the slide presentation here, um, you'll see that hovering over that, that SU um, log source, that program, that we had a little over 6,000 entries that were coming from that log source, and that amounted to just almost 9% of the data set. If I click on this, though, this is where it gets really cool, because when I click on that, all the way up at the very top, it's going to actually build one of these filter boxes, and that's one of these little kind of oval, rounded corner looking boxes here. And it's going to then filter your content. So if you remember back a couple of slides, I said it's gonna show you all of the documents that are in scope. So if I were to create this, uh, this filter shown here, the syslog program filter, it means that it's only gonna show entries that meet that condition, where the syslog program uh, keyword field is equal to SU, and then it's going to limit me just in this case to those 6,440 different records. So a really quick and easy way to filter, sometimes through millions or hundreds of millions of entries. This doesn't end here though, because if you were to mouse over that, you'd actually see that that filter box has given us five different icons. And this is a way that from left to right, I can hit the checkbox, which will either enable or disable that particular field, uh, that filter rather. The pin, the little push pin icon, is gonna determine whether that filter is going to last across all of my different dashboards. Because right now we're just looking at the syslog dashboard. So we can actually pin, in, pin that search into other dashboards, which can be very helpful. The middle one I'm gonna come back to because that's going to invert the filter. And then I can either delete it or I can edit that filter, kind of tweak it in the uh, environment itself. But the middle one's where I usually do most of my work because when I need to look for something, sometimes I wanna kind of partition out what I've just been looking at and just look at everything else. Well, these actually give me a great way to do it because if I click on that center icon, which in this case is that little magnifying glass, you'll see that it's going to convert that into a red filter box and it's gonna negate into a not. 
Now, if I were to mouse back over this, I'd get a, a plus sign filter uh, magnifying glass, and I can negate it back to a must-have or to a, a, a blue one. So it's a neat way to kind of get your hands around the uh, the ability to to quickly and easily filter among your data set that you have there. And there's one other way to build those. It's not just pie graphs and other visualizations you might customize and build. Um, if you go back to that listing of the unrolled document details, all those fields and their corresponding values, you get a couple of icons in the middle here, uh, which are gonna allow you to build uh, different filters or uh, add it to the display of the summary. So from left to right, these icons in the little red box are gonna be to build a blue filter, build a red filter. The third one is going to add a column to your summary field. So uh, the question before about adding new fields to the listing, you can, uh, as long as those are actually present. So it doesn't do regex or anything like that, but it does do uh, the ability to add to your summary kind of spreadsheet. And then that little asterisk on the right-hand side is going to build a filter that ensures you're only looking at records where that field exists. So if I were to click this uh, asterisk that's in the box right now, it would build a filter to ensure that I only got records where there was a source IP because not all of them might have that. A lot of them may be, uh, and may be devoid of that particular data set. So different ways you can always build those. And, um, you know, in terms of uh, some of the modifications that people were asked about, um, can you do filters based on variables by host or by source? You can do some pretty complex stuff. Um, I'm not gonna get into, in this presentation, uh, the Apache Lucene filter syntax. It is extremely flexible and you can do some pretty amazing stuff with it. Um, I'd venture to guess with a little bit of research into Apache Lucene, I'd be pretty sure you can build some of those variable filters. I'm not sure off the top of my head. Um, question about um, any integration with uh, some data visualization libraries. Uh, this is all self-contained, so we are uh, just using what Elastic has actually provided for us. So we're kind of sticking to, uh, to their core level of functionality. Um, and uh, also, oh great, and a note from Derek as well, uh, that the VMware vCenter converter can import our current VM. Well, that's good. I do not have a, an ESX infrastructure to test that, so I appreciate the testimonial on that. I'm glad to hear that it's, uh, it's working for you in, uh, in production, and it sounds like you've downloaded that and you're uh, undergoing it right now. Pretty cool. Well, this free form search is really, really powerful. Um, if you go back to John's talk and, uh, and take a look at the way he describes the, um, the way that the Elastic maps, uh, that Elastic creates the mapping in its storage engines, um, one of the great things is it's gonna segment up or tokenize your strings, which means any word is gonna be able to be, uh, to be searched pretty easily. So if you take a look up at the top, instead of adding a filter, you can see I just typed in a single word, SHA-1. Maybe I want to find anybody who's attempting to exploit outdated um, uh, SHA, uh, any kind of entry that, that includes they're using an outdated hash algorithm. And as soon as I hit apply on this, you see that I got a bunch of different options. And in this case, they all happen to be pretty much the same type of log entry because I loaded a bunch of SSH logs. But you'll see that any place that SHA-1 sequence of characters was uh, appeared in that record, I not only narrowed down my scope without using a filter, this time using a search string, and I narrowed that down and it gave me the highlights that showed me where it was found. So uh, that's a pretty, pretty convenient thing for us because it means that we're able to identify just based on broad searches, uh, which records are in scope. And then again, you're exploring that data. So you can unroll each of these records and see what they contain and maybe see which fields contain the string that you're interested in. So it's a great way when you're maybe not quite so sure what you're looking at, you're starting with a very weak lead, you can still just plug that weak lead in and you don't have to know the structure of the data because you're gonna be able to search for that in pretty much any, uh, uh, any fields possible just by typing in a bare word. There's a lot more you can do with Lucene and uh, I could probably spend three hours on that to be honest. Uh, instead of doing that, just realize that Lucene is worth your time to learn and get a little bit familiar with, even if it's just the basics, which you can probably pick up in 10, 15 minutes. It is a very powerful way for you to, uh, to leverage your, your questions into potentially large data sets as well. So pretty, uh, pretty slick capability. Our next um, dashboard that I have here 
is going to actually be our NetFlow dashboard. And I mentioned before that NetFlow is a statistical summary, so no content. We are not loading PCAP data. We are just, in this case, loading um, what appears to be, uh, excuse me, uh, what appears to be just a short period of time worth of data. So uh, we're loading here about five days worth of NetFlow from one of my own infrastructures. And it just amounted to about 30 gigs worth of traffic. Um, you can see the summaries and the different colors that you're seeing in these graphs here are going to uh, re represent the different protocols. Um, in this case, the purple is ICMP, the green on top of that is UDP, and then the blue on top is TCP. So it's a way you can kind of visualize your data as well. And because that is in logarithmic uh, scale on the, on the Y axis, you can uh, get a pretty clear idea of where even the small data points are, especially on that ICMP side, because that pales in comparison to the TCP, but with that logarithmic scale, it still is able to stand out and not get completely dwarfed by the, uh, the larger data transactions. As we look a little bit further down though, this is where it starts to get interesting. Um, each of these are searchable, so you can click and drag in order to maybe explore some of these uh, interesting little spikes that show up, or maybe you see a huge drop off you'd be able to filter on that pretty quickly and just narrow in on that time period, which is really helpful when you've got a couple hundred million records that you're looking at and you, you want to try and identify visual anomalies. And then scrolling down is where we get our source and our destination categorization. Um, source IP address, of course, that kind of goes without saying. Certainly is important for us to know who our large consumers or large uh, generators are in terms of traffic. And if you let me skip over to the far right hand side, I also have our source and destination port. So we're going from layer three addressing into layer four, and all of those are gonna be dynamic and queryable, kind of pivotable as well. In the middle, we got our maps, and uh, those maps are going to basically give you an idea of the geolocation of either the source or the destination of that traffic. And they're kind of in heat map form. You can kind of see the uh, legend down below at the very bottom. And it's incredibly helpful when you're trying to get an idea of broad understanding of traffic kind of patterns. Uh, we all know that IP-based geolocation is not perfect. Uh, however, it is going to be enough for us to get some broad trends. Um, in the top section here, uh, that little reddish blob that you see on the west coast of the U.S., that's because that's where my server communicates a lot with. Um, so that's going to actually be one of its primary peers, and I expect that to be seen in my data sets. And if I don't, then it means something's anomalous. There's a problem that I need to dig into. We also have more detailed information down below. Um, if you've got multiple exporters, as many people do, we have those broken out in the list. We also have the uh, source and destination autonomous systems that are listed. And again, I want to clarify and confirm that the GOIP lookup as well as the autonomous system lookups are on system. So they are not being offloaded. They are all being done right on the box itself. And then down below that discovery tab is going to be the uh, spreadsheet like listing of the records, which we can explore exactly as we did the previous logs when I showed you the breakout. So NetFlow itself has different records. Of course, we're not going to have things like username because you can't get that from NetFlow, but it's going to allow you to build queries on this particular data set as well. Ooh, I keep going a little bit too far. Last dashboard that I want to, well, second to the last. I've got another one tucked in the back there. Um, but the, this dashboard is going to be based on your web server logs. And we've kind of expanded the concept in a few different dimensions. Um, I'm showing both the request methods along the top timeline as well as the response codes down in the, uh, the second timeline. And uh, just as we saw before, fully interactive, fully searchable. And these are really helpful for you to get an idea of patterns of traffic and then any kind of anomalies that may jump out at you. Um, you kind of see these rolling hills in the top one because on a daily basis, my server in this particular case that I pulled in was going to be pulling in more requests during the East Coast daytime based on the customers that use that particular server. That's a pretty normal behavior. Whenever you might see something that doesn't match that, of course, it becomes an investigative anomaly that you want to try to, uh, to figure out. We see our autonomous system numbers as well, basically identifying where that traffic's coming from. And then a little bit down below, we virtual visualize this based on source host name, as well as source IP address and geolocation, user agents, which can be invaluable for trying to characterize uh, behavior in, uh, you know, in your environments if you have that available. Of course, any of this that is in, uh, you know, if you're looking at uh, HTTPS logs that are being generated from your own server, they're going to be very helpful if 
you're looking at traffic in line with something like a proxy server, you're not gonna get that information from an encrypted data flow. It's just kind of the way that we are limited with. But if you're intercepting with a TLS proxy, SoftElk's gonna handle that for you as well. And then of course, just as the other two dashboards down below, we've got our discovery panel, which will allow you full exploration of all those fields that you might, are, uh, that you might be interested in. Um, let's see, a couple of questions that came in I wanna try to get to as well. Um, let's see, yes, you can unload data sets. I'll show you what that looks like in a minute. Good one as well. And um, let's see. So uh, we got other types of logs that people are talking about. Ubiquity user, I see you got that, Gerald. Very nice. Um, you know, glad to hear that uh, that you're able to use it in those environments. And a uh, good question came in that I want to hit. Is there any requirement that Soft Elf, Soft Elk have internet access? There is not. There are some benefits that you'll get which I'll touch on at the end here, but you can run this in a fully air-gapped environment and it'll work just fine. Um, all right, let me go on to this. Let's talk about some of the, the kind of, I like to call them creature comforts that I've built in. Because although my, my career has included quite a few system administration functions, I know a number of years to have as well, it's not really necessarily the thing that everybody wants to deal with. So sometimes we just want it to work. And updating is something that we built in. Um, because of the fact that all our config files are kept in GitHub, I do have a script that's built in, which you see running here, and it's going to reach out to GitHub and it's going to pull down any updates that are available. And to the question about internet access, this is definitely an area where that will help. Um, when it ships, we do you know ops check it and test it and everything, but we have both improvements and bug fixes that get built in as time goes on. And as soon as you run this command, it's going to reach out to GitHub if you have access, and it's going to pull down any updates. And most importantly, it's going to activate them all, so you don't have to do anything. I've come kind of packaged up all that upgrade functionality into a bunch of shell scripts, which are going to run automatically, so you don't have to worry about it. Basically, you run the command. And then you've got the updates that are available, which means, first of all, I don't have to create a new virtual machine distribution whenever we push stuff to GitHub. And it means you don't have to download another VM every time there's an update either. There will be certain system grade, uh, system level updates that will require a new VM, but I try to keep those to a couple of times per year. And we'll talk a little bit about when that might happen and what that next version may entail a little bit down the line. Something else that you want to do is unload data. A question came in about how we're going to unload that data, and that's actually another script that I've built in here, and it's this clear script. Um, now, one of the things that happens under the hood is that there are a lot of different indexes uh, which are going to be used for storing that data because I treat NetFlow differently than I treat web server logs differently than I treat syslog data, for example. So when you run it with the dash I list option, it's going to tell you which indices are present as well as how many documents in each. And once you identify the ones that you might want to um, delete, you can actually use the same script with a slightly different syntax. And I can go in here and do the, uh, the deletion here of everything in the log stash. It's going to ask for my password because I'm using sudo, of course, and it's going to delete those and optionally reload them if I use that dash R option at the end. And this is going to be helpful if, for example, I were to release an updated parser. Um, I actually just pushed some parser changes this morning, and that requires data to be reloaded, which means you can use this script here, and it actually ends up taking care of anything that's on the file system. Clear will take it out of the, uh, the index, but not the file system. And then the reload will take care of bringing it back into the index if you wanted to do that. So it's a nice way to, uh, to kind of do that management as well. Um, let's see. Uh, question about, is there a command to add this to an existing sent OS machine? Unfortunately, there's not. Um, there's just way too much going on under the hood, but there is a couple of uh, uh, idea, a few ideas on the horizon that I want to, uh, to talk about later on that may make that more feasible. So what's the latest stuff we've got? Well, the version that we have uh, was released in conjunction with a brand new complete reboot of the Forensics 572 course. And it was released to the public in early January, and I've got a whole bunch of updates that have gone in since then because you can use that updater script in order to pull, pull on if you'd like to do so. But the big changes is that we moved to Elastic Stack version six. Uh, we are right now on 6.5.3, 
which I realize is uh, is not the latest tree, but um, you know they they move quickly, and and we are constantly testing the, the right time for us to do an upgrade. Um, but six five three also required us to redo all the parsers, redo all the dashboards from scratch. Um, long story short, Kibana included an API, so I didn't have to use the one that I wrote originally for it, which is not very elegant, I must admit, but it worked. And then we were able to use their API, so it required a complete almost do over, which was a lot of work. Um, so that was the big change that we had. Uh, I also just recently, I believe yesterday or the day before, revamped our visualizations. And uh, these do require internet access as well. So I should have mentioned that previously because it uses Elastic's tile service for all of those maps. And I added a new dashboard, which I'm gonna show you here, um, which does login tracking. And this was actually created for Security 501. Dave Shackelford said, hey, it would be really cool if I had a dashboard that integrated NetFlow and Syslog data. I said that would be great, but would be even cooler is if it integrated NetFlow and a lot of different types of log data. So this is the login dashboard that we have. Um, I have this one right now limited to just SSH, but what we're doing here is we're correlating NetFlow along the top row, same graphs we showed before, and we're correlating that based on the log events themselves. So our second entry is gonna reflect the fact that we have a, a timeline based on syslog data, and this is gonna actually now just include my SSH login records, and you can see that in this particular time frame and data set, there were almost 800 failed logins with no successful ones. So maybe this might indicate that we've got some kind of uh, you know brute forcing going on, which isn't uncommon, of course, with an internet-connected machine, but at least it gave us the ability to see any kind of ratios between what was or what was not present. Uh, in terms of the uh, the login results, success or failure. The source map is gonna be a way that we can actually visualize those events themselves. And then if we scroll down just a little ways in that same dashboard, the login dashboard, I have both the raw NetFlow content in the discovery tab, as well as the syslog data. So here you can see the TCP connections. And the reason I've got these is because I might wanna know if there was a TCP connection which involved a, a massive amount of data that was transferred. And maybe I wanna find out what user was there. Obviously a large data transfer probably is a successful login event. So if I were to then pivot on that, maybe build a search or a filter up at the top, now I'm gonna be able to look across my logs and my NetFlow in the same site picture, the same visualization, which is a really convenient thing and it helps us to uh, get to one of the core tenets of forensics, which as I use in class all the time, is to get to good findings fast. So it's gonna help get you accurate, reliable information across a large data set in a short amount of time. That's certainly a great way for us to, uh, to approach forensicating in general. So what are we looking at in the future? Um, we are going to move to Elastic Stack version seven, which is in beta right now. I have no insight to timing, so please don't ask that. Um, my guess is that we're gonna see that go into general availability in the next month to month's timeframe. Uh, that's my guess, please don't hold me to it if I'm wrong. However, when that happens, we're gonna start doing our finalization of the Elastic Stack version seven. Um, I've actually got some help from a few uh, secret weapons that I'm gonna be bringing in to help make that a little bit of a faster process, and that is still gonna feed into the public open source toolkit. And it's gonna add on features like regular expression searching, it's gonna add on features like um, uh, predictive searching, tons of really, really cool stuff that I'm very excited for. I also wanted to open it up for more easy means of contributing. Uh, and by this, I mean, uh, right now, I admit it's, it's a little difficult for somebody who's not me to contribute to. So I need to spend some time writing documentation instead of parsers and dashboards and give some good guidance to the community in general about how they can contribute parsers and dashboards so that that way you can take a look and build something awesome and then submit that in a pull request. I'll do some QR, uh, QC on it and then we can hopefully integrate that and make it available as a community resource as well. And then in terms of the question about building this into an existing virtual machine, I am working toward an Ansible playbook that will deploy and configure a number of these components. Uh, that has proven to be more difficult than I had anticipated and I wanna make sure we get it right. So that's why we don't have it yet. Uh, so at that point, you could potentially build that into either a single instance or a clustered environment and, uh, and basically build that entire set of functionality across your own capabilities. So that is an actual goal, an absolute goal. 
I don't have a time frame on those, but there are things that I am eager to continue working on as, uh, as we see some of these new features come together. And then the next question everybody wants to know, is this gonna work in Docker? And the answer to that is maybe. Uh, I'll be honest, I am still learning a lot about Docker and I'm very excited about the possibilities that it brings, um, but it is something that is a very different way of thinking than I am familiar with. So I wanna make sure that I take the time to invest and learn in that, learn about that first. So it's a direction that we're potentially looking toward. Um, I do also need to make sure this is something that works really well in class. So I try to make sure that it's streamlined and consistent. So we're just balancing those different, uh, uh, those different priorities overall. That's the end of the material that I've got for you. And uh, there's the URLs that you're gonna need here on screen. And before I get into any uh, other questions, I just wanna thank you for your time. I realize some of you may need to drop off. And uh, as uh, Carol had mentioned, this material will be provided for you uh, a little bit later on. You'll get the recording as well as uh, the slide deck, which because of all the animations probably won't be very useful for you. So I would suggest or looking for that recording and maybe just scrubbing through that to find the resources you're interested in. But I know there's a couple more questions that are in here. I wanna to get to those. And if you do have any others, feel free to type them in. Um, I will be happy to try and answer them here for you. And uh, the last thing that I wanna mention is that if any of you are going to be at RSA, I'm going to be leaving in about 45 minutes to fly there. I will be there, uh, what is it, uh, Wednesday and Thursday. Uh, I will be on the, the uh, expo floor with Red Canary for part of that time. Um, but if you do run into me, I will have some soft elk stickers. I will be happy to give you one of those if you can find me. Um, please just don't ask the Red Canary folks because they won't have them and they're busy doing other stuff, but definitely find me and I'll be happy to, uh, to track you down. I'll make sure that that's something I've got in my bag at all time. So a couple of the questions that we had here. Um, has anyone successfully gotten this running in uh, AHV or Nutanix? You know, I don't know that. Um, I distribute it through virtual, through uh, VMware just because that's what we use in the class. I can tell you anecdotally that people have converted this into um, VirtualBox. Uh, that is something that does work, although it is not supported. But if you've got feedback to provide on that, we're definitely happy to um, uh, happy to uh, try and um, take your, your information and put that out publicly as well. Um, drawbacks when the version changed. Um, you know, I stopped supporting the old version just because it's just me doing this and uh, a couple of other folks part-time help. And uh, I would say that, uh, you know, what you lose is, is the new version of Elastic is the primary thing. Um, so yeah, the old one will still work as it was, but it's not something that we're gonna be, uh, we're gonna be fixing here. Um, let's see, uh, let's see, Workstation 14, yes, it does work there. Um, Let's see, uh, da, 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 da. so a question on port reachability. Um, Iman asked about that. Uh, Elastic is uh, reachable on 9200, but only from localhost, uh, so that is limited. The only services that are exposed are going to be SSH and um, the Kibana on 90, uh, 90, uh, 5601, excuse me. So those are the exposed services that we have. Uh, advantages over other forensic IR or security operations distributions. Um, you know, this is something that addressed a lot of needs that I just didn't see handled elsewhere. Certainly is not gonna be a ideal, perfectly suited solution for everybody. And I can accept that, I don't think any tool is, but really wanted to make sure that this was something that was, uh, was helpful and easy to leverage for someone who's not familiar either with uh, Linux system administration or with um, you know, the Elastic administration and configuration. So that's really the, the kind of itches that I sought to scratch with this overall. Uh, Sean asks about feeding in remote stuff, uh, basically NetFlow or logs. The answer is absolutely. That's gonna be that security operations use case. And the readme uh, that's linked here will actually tell you about a helper script that I've included that will help you to open up those firewall ports if appropriate. Um, they are not a full and complete substitute for proper firewall administration. Certainly that's something that you'll want to read up on with the, uh, the firewall D scripts, but that is something you can incorporate in from any number of remote sources and feed them all into this one running instance, which is, uh, which is pretty cool. Uh, let's see, uh, Sean, you asked about securely on 443, uh, right now, um, it is going to be in plain text because it's designed for that kind of 
analyst desktop style deployment, but uh, as we move closer to the Ansibleization, that's something that we'd like to try and incorporate. But of course, anytime we do that, now we're gonna be dealing with certificate mismatches and that's a management nightmare. So that's something that would be left to the user to, uh, um, to try and work toward as well. Um, let's see. Uh, Gerald, you asked a good one here um, about ingesting Sysmon. You know, I would love to get uh, specifically Swift on Security's Sysmon configuration loaded in. It's on my list, and uh, hopefully, I shouldn't um, I shouldn't have too much longer before I can maybe give a try on that. Uh, there's, you know, if I'm estimating conservatively, there's about a bajillion different log sources I'd love to include, and it's all a matter of which ones people are uh, are most interested in in the uh, immediate term. So that's uh, you know definitely something that we'd like to uh, to try and to try and do. Uh, all right, let's see. I know there's a couple of other questions in here. Ah, ooh, Kyle, you have tripped on something fantastic. Um, I didn't mention it here because it's again yet another log source that I need to handle. I have been working with Eric Zimmerman a little bit on the Cape output, and that is something we are going to include. It's uh, it's under, uh, it's in process, let me put it that way. And as soon as we've got the ability to handle that, he's exporting in JSON just for us, and that's gonna give us the ability to include that. And unstoppable Windows incident response, I like it. I think you should trademark that and, uh, and put it on a t-shirt, Kyle, because that sounds pretty awesome. Um, Let's see, let's see, a couple of votes for log types, definitely appreciate those, those help us. Um, let's see, and uh, excellent, a couple of folks uh, offering to help. Jim, thanks for uh, for that offer, I do appreciate that. And uh, I will be reaching out as soon as we have a way to, uh, um, a way to, uh, uh, to, to get some, some plans in play. But I realize there's some other questions there. Um, I'm gonna look through those while the, um, the line is still open, but we are past the hour point. I did wanna thank you for your time again. Um, hopefully you uh, learned a little bit about what we've been working on behind the scenes and what we've built into the latest version of Soft Elk. And most importantly, I hope that you're eager to give it a try. Um, check it out, download it, come down from my Backblaze repository and uh, you'll be able to start booting that in no time and uh, double bonus points to uh, I forget who it was but somebody who said that he downloaded that and put it into his own virtualization infrastructure during the webcast that's pretty awesome and uh, definitely makes me smile thanks very much everybody and uh, you got you know, all the contact information you might need here uh, I look forward to hearing your results uh, let us know how things are working for you hopefully I'll see you in class sometime please feel free to stop by and say hello if you're at any of my upcoming classes and uh, other than that, I appreciate uh, you hanging out with us for a part of your day, and uh, I, uh, I wish you a good rest of your day, whatever time that might be where you are. Thanks very much, everybody, and uh, have a great rest of, uh, rest of your day. All right, and thank you so much, Phil, for your great presentation, which helps bring this content to the SANS community. To our audience, we greatly appreciate you listening in. For our schedule of all upcoming and archived SANS webcasts, including this one, please visit sands.org forward slash webcasts. Until next time, take care, and we hope to have you back again for the next SANS webcast.